Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sonia Kraszewska. I'm very happy to be here in Lisbon. I attended an API conference six years ago, so I'm so happy to be back. It's a lovely sunny day, so can you turn to the person sitting next to you and give them a big, big smile? <laughs> and a hug, if you feel like it. hugging, okay? Um, after all, I'm here um, partially representing Humanizing Le Language Teaching website magazine, which is all about caring and sharing. Uh, I think there will be lots of hugging in London later on today. Uh, news from Kensington Palace is that Kate is in hospital, so we are waiting news for more hugging probably later on. Now, as you were coming in, early come, early bird catches the worm, first come, first served, receive those brochures, which are uh, brochures that um, promote Pilgrim's language courses that we will be running in the summer. You can find them on the Pilgrim's website, and the website will be given at the very end of the presentation. Um, Pilgrim sponsor um, my coming here and Chas Pugliese, so we would like to acknowledge their contribution to the API conference. Um, like I said, I represent the Humanizing Language Teaching website magazine. Um, I would like to invite you to read the magazine and to publish in the magazine. It's free of charge, uh, both for the reading, no fee for the contributor. The good news is that all the um, archive is available for free as well. If you are interested again in publishing, my email is, it will be in the final sn slide so you can take a look and get in touch with me. There is also a little other flyer. You seem to love coming to conferences. There will be a conference in Porto Novo, end of August, a beautiful place in the south of Italy, just on the very beach, basically. Fantastic academic input, lovely food, beautiful beach. Uh, please consider. And now, without further ado, 21st century skills. When Isabel invited me to come here to the conference, to attend the conference, I said, what topics would you like me to address? And she said, oh, two burning issues. One is young learners, which we tackled yesterday, uh, that is bringing down the age at which we start teaching English and what it implies. And the other one, she said, 21st century skills. And I thought, hmm, good one. That's the one that I was dreading. And the reason was, that I'm really, really into 21st century skills, but somehow I couldn't get the map of the field right. I couldn't see the global picture. Because when you come to a presentation at a conference, you get a little pearl, like a little pearl drop. Interesting input. And you think, ah, now I'm going to do that. Then you attend a few presentations during a conference, and you think, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this. And what we need is a bird eye view to see what's going on. It doesn't help that we begin now to hear, not at conferences, language conferences, but from politicians, leading politicians who um, make the mark in the world saying things like, if we want America to lead in the 21st century, nothing is more important than giving everyone the best education possible from the day they start preschool to the day they start their career. Here we're talking about the K-12 American model from kindergarten to grade 12 and then you can rock and roll. So, Politicians talk about 21st century skills. No wonder language teachers start to worry. 
and think, oh, so we need to do some 21st century skills. And I never thought I would be quoting Barack Obama in my life. But this is what he says, to prepare Americans for the jobs of the future and help restore middle class security, we have to out-educate the world. And that starts with a strong school system. So be ahead of other school systems. I think that many European school systems are doing pretty well. And I don't think it will be so easy to out-educate um, our students. And yet, what is very, very important this concern, if politicians are talking about 21st century skills, what does it mean for us, language teachers, in the classroom on a daily basis? By the way, I've seen some of you have been taking pictures of some of the slides. The whole uh, presentation will be available on the API website. So, in some of the slides you will see links, which I will not activate. I won't show you the films, but you can watch them in your free time if you get interested. Now, the White House government website um, gives you the following directives. This is the nutshell from some of the uh, pages. That we need to join the race to the top, redesign and reform the No Child Left Behind um, approach, fortifying science, technology, engineering, and math. This is where the language teacher starts to worry. Right? A bit. And, above all, sparking innovation. Now, a book that is very interesting to dip in is a book by um, Fidel and Company, 21st Century Skills. It comes with a DVD uh, where you can see examples of classrooms implementing the 21st centuries. Very inspiring, but again, we need, to, as language teachers reading the book, we need to filter them through our perspective or readjust our thinking because it's global education, it's education across subjects. But there are a few interesting things in the book I would like to share with you. The first thing, in a sense so obvious, but at the same time so, such an eye-opener, is that education either functions in sort of agrarian age, industrial age, or knowledge age. Now what's agrarian age? Teaching, for example, teaching uh, in months when there is no much happening on the farm. This is consequence of the Middle Ages where the learners, and later um, centuries, where learners had to be taken out of school to help in the field. Now, with air conditioning and all other uh, possible developments, there is no need to say that summer needs to be time off and um, winter holidays, this particular period, or autumn holidays, need to be um, the times when children and teachers get time off, where education stops. Also, in, in the agrarian age, and particularly in the Middle Ages, um, is rooted the division into subjects. Math, chemistry, whatever. Now, we're talking more and more about the integration of subjects in sort of more holistic and global uh, education. Industrial age brought us division into periods, 90 minutes, bell ringing, clock in, are you present, are you absent, attendance. Um, and finally, what we, and edu what educators are talking about now is talking about knowledge age, the age of knowledge. Don't confuse with the age of reason and Bridget Jones. Okay, this is age of knowledge. Uh, the um, 21st century skills um, book, talks about, a lot about P21, partnership for the 21st century. That is, we need to uh, widen, broaden the knowledge, skills, dispositions and expertise, and they need to be learned through hands-on approach and um, experimenting. And, above all, transferring what is learned from one co context to another. Later on I'll be quoting Howard Gardner, but here I would like to say 
something that um, he said in his Five Minds for the Future. Knowledge, and he was obviously quoting from some other sources, knowledge, human knowledge doubles every five years. Technology changes. We need to develop the skills, the tools to learn and be creative and develop new ideas, but the knowledge that we gain will be outdated or may be outdated within five years. In fact, he also says, the world as we know it doesn't exist anymore. The change has already taken place, we haven't noticed yet. Uh, years back there was a lovely, charming book, Who Moved My Cheese? And I think it kind of preempted what we're talking about right now. Change is going to happen. So lean back, enjoy change, and make sure you're prepared for change. And this is in a nutshell, in a jokey way, what we're talking about with the 21st century skill. The nutshell is be prepared for the cheeses to be moved. For those who don't know the moving of the cheeses, the little mice living in a maze. And there is always the same place where the cheese appears. And suddenly one day the cheese disappears and half the mice are totally confused. And the other half kind of find a way around it, adapt. And then over the years they learn to sniff the cheeses and knowing, oh, the cheese is going to be moved, we'd better get um, ready for the change. And needless to say, they're the survivors. They know change will come, they sniff the cheeses, and they know which way to go and which way to develop. I mean, actually, you are sniffing cheeses right now. I mean, if you sniff properly, you're, you have come here to sniff the cheese, to know what's in the pi pipeline. And I mean, this is a fantastic thing working with language teachers because we're very, very much in the forefront of, oh, here's a change. Multiple intelligences, let's take on board. Um, neurolinguistic programming, can we, how can we use as much IT as possible in language class, how can we use projects, we're really, really interested in new developments because we sniff the cheeses and I think, ah, this can be useful, useful for language um, teaching. So, um, I'm going to skip this slide, these are details of being clever about um, the moved cheeses and cheeses being moved, so you may want to. But the first one says, change happens, full stop, whether we like it or not. Now, um, the 21st century skills mainly relate to oral and written communication. And we would like to say, what's new about that? We've been doing it at language teaching for so and so long. Um, I would like to emphasize communication communication, which I will talk about uh, later. Critical thinking and problem solving. Now, less we are doing elements of critical thinking and problem solving. Some recently published books um, have addressed the subject. Now, let's see how we can do it on a daily basis in a language classroom to be in tune with what may be happening in other subjects, but above all, to make sure that the um, uh, language teacher and language class fits in with the other subjects. Creativity, collaboration and working in teams, media literacy and applying technology, professionalism and work ethics, and eventually leadership and project management. All these are the 21st components on the 21st century skills. And when you look at it, there is nothing to worry about. I mean, we've been doing a lot of that. Courses on leadership, for example, or coaching. This is leadership and project management. However, we need to see how we can take it a step further, how we can develop it, and perhaps we need to tweak a few things, or reform, um, and take the issues on board. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so let's, let, let's take a close-up from the EFL perspective. Oral and written communication. Well, if an ELT lesson tends to test grammar and vocabulary more than ability to communicate. And this is what 
I do a lot of teacher training uh, in service and pre-service and also lesson observation and give feedback and I also tend to look in the class register seeing how grades are located and it's very interesting what you get to see when you look at the grades at the logbook at the class register what the grades have been allocated for obviously testing grammar and vocabulary is the easiest of all easily expressed in points in the industrial model well reading and listening still easily can be taken on board the biggest problem is for example taking on board speaking testing speaking on a regular basis and I will share with you one of my solutions that seems to work and um, um, I feel that I take much more on board this oral communication thing uh, focusing on single words rather than chunks if we focus more on accuracy rather than fluency if we teach writing argumentative essays rather than CVs, reports and proposals and appreciate the students giving the knowledge back and matching the model rather than representing and showing what they have understood and um, showing, uh, promoting creativity then we do not really implement 21st century skills this is not teaching for communication so much more focus on genuine communication and this is something that I've been working with for some time now you know coming up with a good marking scheme task accomplished good um, uh, um, good impression um, good positive influence on the reader uh, good use of vocabulary grammar mistakes um, grammar that doesn't affect communication so reasonably accurate grammar when I come up with with a marking scheme like this my old self when I read this composition or any written assignment I think oh uh oh no 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 he deserves C but when I start ticking according to sort of 21st century skills oh positive effect on the reader mm, task accomplished and I'm always surprised the student fetches higher grade than my first reaction was and this is something that I really really need to work on and these mark sheets really help me and also help to standardize it within the school because if all the teachers use the same system the other students taught by another teacher are not left out and also kind of we sharing the same philosophy and the same approach so um, those marking schemes have helped me a lot to become much more 21st century skills teacher um, the other thing that I discovered is that uh, when I give grades 40% of the final grade comes from a test and 60% from other promoting project work preparation for the classroom contribute contributing to the classes cooperation teamwork and again when I look at the test I think mm, this student uh, doesn't, doesn't deserve to get grade B but when I look at all the other I think ah and this is very helpful for me on the way to become a much more 21st century teacher by the way when we look at the division 40% and 60% of course you can choose it could be 50 50 in order to pass the course in the test component the students must get 50% plus one which is the European Union directive pass mark 50% uh, and they need to get 50% plus one for the other module the contribution project work teamwork and this is perhaps the first step now I think when we talk about speaking speaking very often is about giving advice giving directions teaching functions of language is that right I'm very very um, uh, much in favor of 
doing so much more of spoken grammar and pragmatics and social aspects of speaking. Now, if we teach the students to speak in full sentences and with ac reasonably accurate grammar, they may still not come across as very sociable people because they may not back channel enough. Back channeling? You speak to me and I say, I know, I know, I know, oh, I know. There's a fantastic um, episode in The Faulty Towers. You know, Basil and his wife, and she's on the phone. Sybil is on the phone to her best friend, and the conversation goes more or less like this. She answers the phone and says, Oh, Audrey. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, I know. I know. He doesn't deserve you, does he? Oh, I know. I know. And Basil says, If you know, why is she telling you? <laughs> Now, Basil was here socially insensitive or linguistically insensitive because it's in many cultures, and this is not to say uh, in every language, but in English it's very important that you back channel. You say, uh-huh, uh-huh, I know, I know. Some nations don't do that and they may come across as not very sociable or interested in the conversation. And here I would like to say, I'm not saying that now when we teach English to Portuguese to students, Polish students, Russian students, we want them to behave like the English people do, or British people do. Well, they might find it useful, especially if they decide to work in the UK or with English people in Portugal. However, it teaches social sensitivity that other nations, when using English as lingua franca, may act slightly differently. The Finns, when having a conversation, they will, you will say something, especially to, to men speaking, you will say something, go silent. If you've been silent long enough, then I know it's my turn to speak. Being aware of different patterns of communication and behavior may be vital because this poor Finn won't get a chance with a Pole, with an Italian, with a Portuguese, yeah, you kidnap the conversation, you interrupt. Okay, we do too. Okay, so, so all these little things, and this is not to say now you have to do it to behave like an English person. This is to say you are aware, and you observe, and you perhaps match, or you find out how um, another nationality uses English as a lingua franca, how can I suc successfully communicate? Back channeling, hedging, many, many features which are part of the spoken grammar. Vital for teaching speaking are equally important, as important as teaching a particular function, giving directions, giving instructions. Teaching the right intonation. My favorite uh, anecdote a Croatian teacher shared it with us. An advanced student went to London and she couldn't find a book, foils. So she said to the shop assistant, can I have the book please? And the shop assistant said, get it yourself. <laughs> and she left the shop w with the uh, conviction that the English hate the Croatians. And she didn't realize it was her intonation, her falling intonation with please. Okay. Now, Jim Scrivenham is, is here. So, your ARC model has been of immense help to me when teaching speaking. And this learner's exposure to um, all sorts of English. In the good old days when I was learning English, the only source of English was the course book and the teacher. Now, we are a fraction of what the learners are exposed to. And the problem is that they're exposed to all sorts of English. Take a song, it don't impress me much. So what happens is aging non-native English teacher says, you have to say you, it doesn't impress me, or a super duper singer, role model, says it don't impress me much, who wins? Now, thanks to the ARC model, we can, and all my students know this model. Oh, when they come up with something, teacher, look, and I say, oh, authentic, 
authentic use. And then we do a test and they say, oh, restrict it. And then we talk about what, when. A lovely example. A student was doing a test and there was a question, question tag. So needless to say, you had to finish, put in the question tags. And the students wrote two answers. So, you know, she is at home, isn't she? And he did it, didn't he? And then put a line on the margin and said, in it. <laughs> this student showed that he knows authentic use, restricted use, and teacher, you choose which one you want. Lovely example. Uh, so basically, you use language to achieve a name. English is not an aim in itself. And my recent experience with secondary school pupils was that they were, because they start learning English earlier and earlier and l earlier, they get bored. By the time they're secondary, they're so bored with general English classes. They want meat. They want to see how it will fit in with their jobs, how it is aspirational English, I call it. I see through the English I'm learning what kind of job I will be doing or what kind of roles I may be in. So extremely important to take this on board. I would say in secondary, at secondary level, much more IELTS type of texts texts that are quasi-academic, that would help the students to study in English because it's very likely they will be going on some Erasmus project or will join a project which will involve English, marketing and, um, and sales, for instance. I will sh show you an example of such a project. So I think that the course books at secondary level definitely need to take a different slant because it's just too much. The earlier we start, the sooner we need to start doing other things at secondary level. Now, there is lots of critical thinking um, promoted. I would like to share with you a few exercises that worked for me. This is an exercise where the students read a text and they ask questions. Questions to which there are no answers in the text. So when it says that the Spanish lawyer has given up his job and sold his car, the question is, what car did he drive? And then you have to say, lawyer, 37, what kind of uh, car would he be driving? A red Porsche, not yet, um, too young, what could he afford? So you would, and then the students write the answers, and then they write the alternative text. This is teaching, not reading comprehension, this is teaching understanding. And this is what critical thinking starts with. Before you think critically, you try to implement so much more of um, understanding what it really means, rather than just um, answering comprehension questions. Because students are very good at answering comprehension questions. And then when we start probing deeper, problems start. Uh, a book published by Heinle, it's an age, uh, has got a fantastic section on, think on critical thinking. I really recommend um, Life, um, John Hughes has got, he, this was the first book that introduced critical thinking. Now I know other course books introduce that and this is not to be overlooked. Because this is looking at understanding, not comprehension. What is, for example, questions like, what is fact, what is opinion? Um, so comprehension versus understanding. Creativity is very important. And before I move on to talking about creativity, I'd like to say that we have set up a group called the C Group. Um, Alan Maley, Chas Pugliese were the founding fathers of um, this movement. You can join the group for free, get all the information and the conferences of C group people. The current issue of HLT, Humanizing Language Teaching, is all devoted to creativity. It's only creativity. I really recommend this issue. Uh, I like to go back to the creativity model of, of Disney because we tend to think, oh, I'm creative. This is what the creativity, what creativity in the classroom involves. This is the model that needs to be um, um, promoted. You need to be a dreamer, but then you need to be a realist and critic. And this is the complete cycle of creativity in the classroom. 
Uh, we could do some mind maps with students on creativity, what creativity uh, means to them. Uh, Nikki Hockley yesterday had a very nice brainstorm and concentric circles on what networking meant. So this is along similar lines. Um, but the biggest problem is how to evaluate creativity from our point of view. That's why creativity is not so often present in the classroom, because you think, okay, great, they be creative and then what? How do I grade it? How do I um, allocate, how do I recognize creativity? And I have found a very, similar, very simple, simple solution. I say, we're going to do the project, we're going to do this, and ask the students, how do you want it to be evaluated? The ball is in their court. <coughs> I promise. They will debate, discuss, argue, because everybody takes into consideration their strength and what they think they will contribute. I was doing um, the same project in two separate groups. Each group came up, same level, same profile. They came up with different marking skill schemes, which I respected. So I had to remember who is from which group so that I mark according to the scheme. And that was a fantastic experience. And I think it's extremely valuable because this teaches them some kind of leadership, working in teams, contributing. And I, needless to say, when the project was done, I evaluated the project following the marking scheme they have come up with, but also they evaluated each other. So they were working in groups, uh, they were debating how to allocate the grade following the scheme. So they were learning a life skill, they were working in teams, they were giving each other feedback, and I promise you there was no brownie points because you are my good friend. Not, not at all. They were very, very strict with each other. Very often, they were stricter than, stricter than I was. So, fantastic experience. Takes a bit more time, but they were doing it in English. It was genuine communication. It was creating an environment in which, in adult life, they will um, be using English. I don't like the Polish Ministry of Education very much, but there is one statement that I always keep thinking about what is language teaching for, or actually two statements, what, what, are, what is it language teaching for in schools? In primary, do you know what it is for according to Polish ministry? To make learners, the little ones, fall in love with learning languages. And I, what I like is not just English, but just enjoy learning languages because we're talking now about plurilingualism and, and multilingualism. And so make sure that they, from the very, very early age, know that learning languages is fun. I enjoy, I want to learn languages. Now, when it comes to secondary and sort of education, it says to prepare students for life. And Many Polish teachers, I observe, prepare for exams. So answering the question, am I preparing for life or am I preparing for exams? And here comes back the marking scheme, you know, positive effect on the reader and uh, task accomplished and not was the grammar accurate and has he used present per perfect correctly in articles. The 21st third, uh, century skills gives a very good example of a SARS project. Actually, the whole book is based on a project on SARS that the students from various schools, various countries put together. And they uh, just illustrate 21st century skills through that project. Now, there is another little example of a project which I really liked, which really shows how 21st century skills work. 20, um, 20 or something students uh, in a Dutch school, I don't remember whether primary or secondary, have made a plan how to create a garden in the neighborhood. It was a bit, a bit of waste land. And they did all the research in, about plants, about costing, about gardening, about the tools they needed. So the full Monty. 
And then they pre proposed it to the local government, and it got accepted, and the garden actually materialized. Now, if or when we add some English into it, we have got a perfect 21st century skills. So if they research the tools or the plants online in English, or they gang up with another school from uh, Portugal, and they try to set up similar projects in the countries, and then want to exchange ideas and communicate in English or give each other advice, this would be perfect 21st century skills project and experience. I would like to talk about two, um, some projects, one for the young ones, so similar to the garden experience, Travel Buddy. In HLT Mag, a lady from Iceland described a project, this is the link, um, I'm not giving you her name because you won't remember. It's one of those names, okay? Uh, Travel Buddy is basically you, the little ones have a plush toy, uh, film this plush toy in their environment, take the plush toy home, provide commentary. Then the plush toy and the um, commentary is sent to Australia and then the plush toy visits Australia, and then it travels back. All done in English. Beautiful idea for engaging in a project and getting ready for international projects at a little age. Um, EPOLS is an organization which helps you get um, in touch with schools, make sure that they are safe. Nikki Hockley was giving some other examples of links to similar websites and organizations, because obviously we need to be sure that um, we're really corresponding with another school. Uh, very recently, uh, Jamie Keddy, whom you probably know from his book Images, at ITEFL Manchester Conference is talking, was talking about his new uh, project and his new book, uh, which could be fantastically implemented with sort of, you know, research, little projects with students from all over the world. Videotelling.com, I know it will be a book very soon. This is uh, the website, if you join, if you sign in, you will get um, information and handouts. Also in the June issue of HLT, in the letters section, there will be more about it. So we're corresponding with Jamie how to promote this uh, idea. Um, how, and he makes a very, very important point. Um, because, you know, we can get carried away with projects, and he made it very clear you need to get parents' permission if the children under such and such age will appear in the, you know, he was talking, uh, in the film, he was talking about different ways of bypassing the presence of a person, a figure, in the um, a film, so just filming from behind and providing a commentary or wearing masks and so on. Um, so it's a very important issue and I was very grateful. Of course we need to promote learn autonomy and we can start with little things. And I'd like to share with you two activities that I absolutely uh, adore, or perhaps three. I asked the students to draw a bicycle. Could you draw a bicycle, do you think? There is a catch. You can only draw these parts you know the names of in English. Ah. Now, this is a task for you. If the little ones do it, because critical thinking and thinking skills start from the cradle, you ask them to draw a house. And you immediately see what bits are missing. And then you tell the students, you can draw or you can research names of six small parts that are vital to complete the bike. What's the most important part of it? Learner autonomy. I can see what I don't know and I decide what I learn. And I promise the very, very experienced cyclists who knew a lot of names of the parts still found bits they wanted to learn and those who knew very little about bicycles. 
but we don't do, okay, this. <laughs> These students, we're going to learn about the bike. Here are the parts. So here's an example of the students' work. Of course, using ICT is very, very important uh, for researching and becoming an independent, autonomous learner. Now, um, we can do gimmicks. And for example, Katy Perry um, does a song where it's, all the words are through emoticons, or most of the words, so the link is there. And Google Fight, where you take two words or two phrases in English, you put them into, type them into two boxes, and then those little, two little creatures um, um, find, fight with each other to see which is more common on Google. So Google is used as a corpus. And these are the gimmicks with which sort of we can toy around. But the, the problem is, and Nikki Hockley was talking about it yesterday, is that the students are not that keen to use Facebook, for instance, for language learning. Facebook is very often seen as for something else. And I know of a school which tried to use uh, Facebook for projects. It was a kind of academia type of school with learners having lots of autonomy. And it did not work. The teachers were lucky if the students read the post, but to reply was really, really, to get a reply was very rare. And perhaps an option is to, have, to use Google Classroom, to, have, to create some concrete space which is really um, uh, reserved for learning. But on the other hand, we want to say that teaching, learning is integral part of your life, and if Facebook is an integral part of your life, you may want to incorporate that. So that, but we take our, we, we make decisions ourselves. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Now we need to do. There's so much available. I, I, I'm, it's difficult to choose. And what I would like to say is, imagine you opening an Indian restaurant, and you will need rice. Obviously. Now think of all the rices available in the world. Now you have to make your choices and you can't use every single rice because you will go bankrupt. And the same thing with all the resources. I would say choose a few, use them effectively and gradually introduce them to your teaching. At the moment I'm teaching an ICT course, teaching, teaching um, English with technology. And the biggest problem is not the technology, but weaving the technology and weaving some methodology about it around the technology. So what, I have got this nice tool, but I need to know what to do with it and have a sound method to go with it. Um, obviously, uh, we can use, sorry. The first thing we need to do is teach the students to use online dictionaries and make sure that they have got apps with dictionaries. It's not obvious. The only one students that I, I see that use dictionaries regularly are the group of Saudi students I teach in Poland who, well, they wouldn't survive without a dictionary, right? Um, but we may want the students to research language using concordancers, be their own, do their own language research and be little linguists. But my favorite tool is Vokuru. Vokuru is a voice recording tool and basically what you do is you click the button, you speak, you finish, you click the button and you send the link or the mp3 to the person you want, um, you want to, um, uh, who, want, uh, who will listen to it. And I use it in the, in the classroom, my students have to give me samples of their spoken English, either conversations which would be up to eight minutes long, uh, or monologues. I don't ask them to send me MP3, because MP3s can be in different format and you get stuck and you spend ages trying to un undo and try to listen to it. They, send, they have to send me the link to their recording, which is stored on the server. They have to send a link to themselves, so that if something goes wrong, they have, they have saved a copy otherwise of the link, otherwise um, they have to record again, it's gone. 
Um, there is a marking scheme I, um, I have designed so the students know it. So when I click the button and listen to the recording, I just tick boxes and perhaps write a few words of comment. An eight minute dialogue between two students takes about 10 minutes to mark because there's a bit of admin and opening the file. Uh, so it means five minutes per student. Marking an essay takes much longer. But the students get genuine feedback. Now you may say, do they cheat? You can tell when they cheat. And I have got a few examples when they have written a dialogue and then they are reading. And I can use them and say, well look, this is not what we want. And can you hear it? If they rehearse a few times, fine, fine by me if they want to spend more time. But one thing you can, I hope, hear from what I'm saying, I know this tool. I have used Vokaroo. I know every single trap. I don't want MP3, I want the, the link. I know what can go wrong, I know the timing. Now if somebody, when I go to a talk and people tell me, oh, there is a nice tool, 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 but they don't show me how to use it. I'm not sure they have really used it themselves and designed some sort of methodology. So I think a little is a lot, to quote Gatania. A lovely website, Learning English. L uh, uh, uh. BBC Words in the News, that's the old website. Now there is new website. What you've got is the news, the text, the recording, the words, or video. Perfect. A bit more methodology. And if you use, for example, um, if you use um, Moodle, e-learning on Moodle, then you can take this text, write a few true-false questions, and uh, the students work with the text and then they take the boxes. Talking of Moodle, I would like to share one, one concern with you, because I work with e-learning courses. There are universities in Poland, especially private universities, which um, deliver half their courses uh, through Moodle and e-learning. There is no price for guessing that this is how they cut costs, right? But the state university I work for has got also e-learning platform, Moodle, and when I compare the way the two platforms work, I can see one major difference. The private university makes sure that there are lots and lots of e-learning courses because they cut costs, but they check every single course for copyright and intellectual property. If you decide to write an e-learning course, everything needs to be your intellectual property. You cannot scan a page and put it on, on the website. You can put a link. Now, at my state university, gets away with murder, or probably will get away with murder up to a point. Now, we need to remember that you know technology is fine, but there is also intellectual property copyright and make sure that we play safe. And that's why with this solution I have got this nice text recording. The students can, the link is there, the archive <coughs> is available. The students can access it. I write only my tasks on the Moodle platform and I'm covered because this is my, the questions are my intellectual property. The link to the text is there but they access it on a website which is public domain. Very important. Because we never know when the get governments are going to turn around and say, oh, let's check. Uh, a website I learned about two weeks ago during the Manchester conference. No idea what it is, uh, what it really offers, but I know it offers lots and lots of videos on a given theme. And if I understood correctly, you can type in words that you are interested in and it will select videos which feature these words. This is what I understood, okay? <laughs> so, um, if I understood wrongly, please, uh, I apologize. But it looks very interesting, Cent English Central. Engvid, English videos, another website. And this is a website I didn't know about it. My student told me, said, oh, you know, when I want to improve my English, I watch this. Great. Uh, 
of course, Stella Russell, Stella, uh, Russell Stannard was here yesterday, so I don't need to recommend his page to the training videos, but it's there. Um, like I said, a Google Classroom may be an option. However, you cannot join individually Google Classroom. You have to join as a school. So I cannot show you. I cannot show you because the school I work with where I'm a consultant, I don't have the access to Google Classroom um, because they decided they want only the teachers and the students have access, not even the advisors. So. Um, but it may be an interesting option. Now we need to learn on students' visual literacy. And this is fantastic because we have been using pictures a lot in language teaching. Visual literacy involves comparison, con categorizing, sequencing of pictures, focusing attention, memorizing, many, many features. There is a very interesting document, the Visual Literacy White Paper. The, it's uh, very the vital, the most crucial issues concerning visual literacy. And why is it important? It's not only pictures. It is, of course, fine arts, but it could be web charts, musical notations, scientific charts, maps, graphs, logos, timetables, stats, statistics. So this is the material I would like to see more in our English course books, because this would be in tune with 21st century skills, and would and liven up the material that we get in the course books. Because we usually get an article, a poem. And it was Scott Thornbury once said that if you want to address a topic, it's important to make sure that you have, say it's health, that you have a song about health, a poem about health, something about uh, health in literature, a, um, text from a professional journal, or popular science uh, magazine, different approaches. I think we need more variety in the time, type of material. And this would bring us, again, closer to this IELTS type of text. Of course, we need to do subject integration, like I mentioned earlier. We need to integrate the subject so that we closely cooperate with other teachers and we can do it in our little world and, you know, to introduce the uh, atomic, the um, table of elements, we need, may use a very old song by Tom Lehrer, The Elements, and when I played it to the students, they said, oh, because the song is basically the names of elements song, it's a sort of 60s tune. And then I said, okay, how about that? And they, David Redcliffe of um, Harry Potter does his own version of this. And then suddenly they loved it. Okay? So there is a new, newer version and you may want to use it. Oh, we can talk about the painting and talk about social history. This is a kind of clue we can take on board. But the true clue is a project I was involved in. It was called Szkoła Sukcesu, the School of Success. And that was genuinely 21st century skills, where there was a course of entrepreneurship run in Polish, then there was a module in English where they were learning this vocabulary and this content in English. Then they had an option either to do it in English or in German, so there were two lines. They had another course in ICT on promoting your company, your product, online. And the final test was they had to produce a brochure promoting their area in English or in German to be circulated at a conference. And this was a genuine um, 21st century skills like project. Of course there comes values and ethical issues like Oxfam Unplugged, taking scientific journals where people pay or don't pay money into the uh, honesty box, depending whether a pair of eyes is looking at them or not. Needless to say, when the eyes were looking at you, you were paying. People who, in Japan, old engineers who decided to go and clear up the um, radioactive area, saying, 
we want to protect the young generation, we have got le less life to live, so we go and tidy up. Um, and I have been talking about 21st century skills for um, 55 minutes. And there was one thing that made me think when I was looking at the book. 21st century skills is Trilling, Fadell, Daniel Goldman is men mentioned, Howard Gardner, the multiple intelligences, Keith Robinson, his talks on TED.com, US government officials. And I turned around and I thought, so what happens to Project Zero, Harvard, Howard Gardner, his new thing, a relatively new thing, Five Minds for the Future, Ron Richard, Caris Morrison, Mark Church, David Perkins. David Perkins, the founding fathers of um, um, Project Zero, or oh, pivotal figures, sorry, because Project Zero was started earlier. And there seems to be two different realities. There is the reality of 21st century skills, of politicians, and there seems to be the world of academia, Project Zero, Harvard, which has been with us for a long time, since 67. Project Zero has been affecting language teaching, and we know we have got lots of the solutions, and we, we have been following it. Multiple intelligences, teaching for understanding, teaching through fine arts, that's 1972-2000 Perkins. So then, 1983, Five multiple intelligences. Then 1998, teaching for, the under, for understanding, making learning visible, and creating cultures of thinking. There is so many things we have got in common, or they have got in common. I don't know whether they're not communicating, not my problem, but for us language teachers, we have got so much more inspiration for what to do in class, because we have got he has a few quotes from Gardner, which I have already used. So, Five Minds for the Future. Here's a link to a fantastic talk by Howard Gardner. And you can access it when you just click on the link. This is what it looks like, talking about developing the discipline, a particular discipline. And there is no language teaching. It's math or science, arts, music developing the disciplined mind, teaching people to synthesize, decide what is important, what is not important, be, being creative, and two important, being ethical and responsible. So you see how, how it overlaps what I was talking about, what is known as 21st century skills. Now, making thinking visible, sorry, making thinking visible, the, um, a book that I would say goes hand in hand with the 21st century skills is presenting routines how to introduce more thinking in the classroom and how to promote that and at Pilgrims we ran a course making thinking visible it's a week's course where all these routines are presented but you can research them online lots of examples of lessons so particular thinking routines to be developed in the classroom like in introducing and exploring ideas, synthesizing and organizing ideas, digging, digging deeper into ideas. They have got particular names, for example, tug of war. I mean, I will give you an example of tug of war. So there are very many, very many uh, ready lessons, but again, for native kids, which we need to adapt, simplify, and see how much we can do in the classroom. I can tell you one thing from my experience last summer when I was conducting the uh, course, delivering the course, making thinking visible. A group of teachers who after an hour and a half of these activities had had enough, their brains were tired. I couldn't do another hour and a half of thinking skills. No way. That we had to have small activities. It's exhausting. Making thinking visible and thinking is an exhausting activity. So we cannot do too much of that, but we can implement. Here are a few examples, nice pictures I found, so I put them in the uh, um, presentation. How to make thinking visible, the thinking routines. Um, so one of the routines is called see, think, wonder. The other one is called think, puzzle, explore. 
this talk is devoted to 21st century skills, but I could not not mention the other strand, Project Zero, and their findings, because I think they supplement the 21st century skill beautifully. Once again, I say I don't understand why they are um, uh, so separate. So Tony Busan mind mapping is of use. And here's an example of the tug of war. This is the one, some, one of the last slides, the tug of war um, idea. Should people retire earlier or later? There is Polish, a bit of Polish, a bit of, bits of English, because the students were researching any source they could. Then they put on stickers, the opinions on stickers. Should people retire early or not? And then they put them on a tug of war. And they move around the stickers to see how valid the arguments are for a time earlier or later. <coughs> so to sum up, English language classes in the 21st century skills, the good news, we already have a lot of the tools and solutions and we can dig into making thinking visible. Now the question is, do we use them? Can our tools be improved? They have to improve, we need to change the slant, we need to tweak or perhaps we need a bit of an, no, I'm not going to use the word earthquake in this context, so we need to shake things up. Um, the, we need to think what we change and not change everything because we're going to get into trouble and there may be too many variables. And finally, two very important things. What is the teacher's profile? Who is a teacher of 21st century skills? Is it a teacher of the language, or is it a teacher who addresses issues much more globally? A manager, a project manager, a coach, and perhaps we need to redefine our profession and how we train teachers for the 21st century. And we also need to see how we fit in with the bigger picture. Um, that's probably why Erasmus Plus now, now wants teachers to come to a given school and not individuals because they want to create not only cultures of teaching but also cultures of education. People who learn to create projects together, cooperate uh, and are on the same wavelength. Thank you very much. Oops. Here is my slide, final slide, my email address. If you would like to read HLT, please do. If you would like to write for HLT, please do. And anyway, drop me an email if you would like to ask any more questions. Thank you.